Well, hello everybody and welcome to our weekly Bible study here at King's Revival Church International. My name is Gareth and I'm so excited uh, to share this week's lesson with you. And wherever you're tuning in from, thank you for connecting with us today. You are our valued guest, our VIP. And uh, wherever you're streaming in from, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, we're um, really excited to have you with us today. Well, my uh, title today is The Christian and His Money. And we're going to look at, at finances today. And you know what? Money is very, very important. And some, some uh, religious people in church, they talk as if money is not important at all. Well, you know what? Very rarely do they act like that when they're outside of church. <laughs> Hallelujah. When it comes to their finances, it's important for everyone. And so money plays such an important uh, part in the lives of all of us that if we don't order our money according to God's will and God's purpose and, and, and God's will, our lives will be out of line in, for the perfect will of God for our lives. And so the right handling of our money is a, is a key to spiritual progress. And I'm going to show you some scriptures in the, in the Bible today that um, backs up my, my statements. And so first of all, the first thing that I want to share with you is that there are two levels of wealth in the Bible. And so we have the material wealth and we have the spiritual wealth. The material wealth is the financial wealth, which is temporary. The finances are not going to last forever. Hallelujah. And then we have the spiritual wealth. This is the wealth that's going to last forever. And this is a higher level of wealth. And so what we do with our material wealth will have a lot to do with how much eternal wealth we end up with one day. And so I want to show you that distinction, that clear distinction in the Bible in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and 26. And we see the life of uh, Moses and Moses is making a very difficult decision within his life. And he chooses to leave Pharaoh, leave the palace, leave the riches of the palace, go into the desert. He was 40 years old. And uh, let's look what the Bible says. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking toward the reward. Hallelujah. So Moses, the Bible says he didn't settle for poverty, but rather he chose the greater wealth because the greater wealth, the, one, the wealth that he was choosing is on another level. And so a, a question that I get asked often is, Gareth, is money good or evil? And so the reason why I think this is a good question is because a lot of Christians talk as if money is evil. And so Let's turn to Revelations chapter 5, verse 12, and let's see what the Bible has to say about money. And in Revelations, we see that the angels and the elders are receiving, are, are, are giving us seven things that the Lamb is worthy of receiving. And so it says, yeah, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. So yeah, we see that the angels and the elders, they're declaring um, with Jesus and they are saying what he's worthy to receive. And so he's worthy to receive power. He's worthy to receive wealth. That was the second thing. Wisdom, might, honor and glory and blessing. So that tells us all those things are good things. They're good things. Jesus is worthy to receive those good things. And the second one is riches, is, is wealth. And so we acknowledge that everything in that list is good and it would be illogical and inconsistent to say that riches is not good. And so when you, when you look at those things, it says, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power. Now, power in itself is a good thing, but power can be misused. Someone that has a position of power 
can use his power to to harm other people. It talks about wisdom. You know, wisdom is a good thing, but you can misuse wisdom. You can use wisdom to um, to manipulate someone or to cheat someone. Wisdom is good, but you can misuse wisdom. And so it's the same with wealth. You know, wealth in itself is a good thing. You can do a lot of good with finances. You can spread the gospel. You can build a church. You can send workers out. You can do a lot of good with wealth, but also it can be misused. So we need to see that money in itself is not evil. It's what you do with the money. Power in itself is not evil. It's what you do with the power. Wisdom in itself is not evil. It's what you do with that wisdom. So yeah, we see that finances is grouped together with these seven things that that the Lord is worthy to receive. And so, you know, it's it's so funny. Some Christians when they're when they're poor or when they have when they're in lack, it's like, no, you know, money is evil. But the moment that God blesses them, you know what, they change their minds very quickly. Hallelujah. And so we look in Haggai chapter two, verse eight and nine, it says, All the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. And the word silver in Hebrew is the word kesef. Kesef is the word silver. And today the modern word for money is kesef. They use that money in Hebrew in, in Israel today. You know what? Some preachers, they say things like, you know what? I don't talk about money. Well, that would be unscriptural. The Bible has a great deal to talk about money. If you look at the second book of Corinthians, chapter 8 and chapter 9, we see two chapters that speak only about money. And those two chapters together are about 30 or 39 verses in the Bible that are solely talking about finances and money. And so Christ, Christ Jesus' ministers of the gospel are obligated to teach about money. Let's look at Acts chapter 20, verse 20. Paul is talking here and he says, How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. Paul says, I didn't shrink back from declaring anything to you that was profitable. Well, let me ask you a, a question. Is it profitable to help Christians with their finances? Is it, does it help them? To, to give them good advice, to give them the solid word concerning their money. Well, it definitely is. In the same chapter, in verses 26, it says, Paul goes on to say, Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I do, did not shrink back, shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And so the whole counsel of God includes what God says about our money. And when you look at Jesus, Jesus had a lot to say about money. Look in your Bibles um, in Matthew 6, 24. This was the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus says to us that we cannot serve God and mammon. So mammon is what they used for, for, for money. And when you look at that word mammon, it's when money... It's the spirit behind, behind uh, money having us, have money that controls us is, is, mon is mammon, that spirit that controls us. And so uh, money shouldn't have us, but we should control the money. We, like we looked earlier on, it's a tool. We have to use the tool. And so in Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So Jesus says, listen, you can't serve God and money. You can only serve one. So he says, he says it's not whether you will serve, but whom will you serve? So it's a, it's a decision that we need to make. And if you look at that scripture, it says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. So if you look there, if you love money, well, that scripture says that you hate God. And he says, you've got to decide who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve money or are you going to serve God? 
in Luke chapter 16, verse 10 and 11, it says, One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. Verse 11, If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? So Jesus is talking about money and God, it's saying that God watches how we handle money before he commits the spiritual riches. So once again, you see those two levels of wealth. There's the material wealth and then there's the spiritual wealth. And so this scripture says that God is not going to trust you the, the spiritual wealth if you can't handle the material wealth. He says, if then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And so, yeah, we see that the way we handle our money is very, very important. And so the word is saying, listen, I can't put you, I can't put you above people and, 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 and fill you with the gifts and, and all these things and promote you in your ministry if you can't take care of your finances, if you can't take care of um, your material possessions, if you can't look after your home, if you can't take care of the, the possessions that you have, for example, you know, keeping your car clean, uh, keeping your house clean, uh, looking after the, th the things that God has given you, God says very clearly, make sure that you're faithful in these things and then I'm going to give you the true riches. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we see that chapters 8 and chapters 9 are dedicated to finances. And it says there in verse 8, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. So Yair is talking about finances. Paul is talking about finances. And what he's really saying is, he says, giving is proof of our sincerity. He says, if you love, then you give. In the same uh, chapter, in verse 24, it says, so, so give proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about you to these men. So it's talking about money and it's talking about giving. Hallelujah. In Matthew 6, verse 21, the Bible says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I love that scripture. And so our heart follows our treasure and so we you know we we got to get the order right it says where the treasure goes the heart follows so the treasure goes before the, the heart where you put your treasure where you put your finances your heart goes towards where you put your finances and so commitment that leaves out our money is incomplete so your heart follows your treasure and, and today I want to share five principles concerning the correct way to give. Five things. And the first, the first point that I'm going to share with you is what we do with our money is not based by the law, but by grace through faith. Hallelujah. John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The grace came through Jesus Christ. So when we look there, we see that the, the law came through Moses. That was the channel. The law came through, through Moses in the form of the commandments. But grace, the channel is Jesus Christ. And the way that, that uh, it's, it's communicated is from the heart, through the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. It says, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Hallelujah. And it is the Holy Spirit is the one that imparts the grace into our hearts. And that's why the Bible says in Proverbs uh, 4, verse 23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Hallelujah. You know, some people might say, yeah, but Gareth, you know, you say that, that uh, we're not under the law. 
we're under grace. Does that mean that I don't have to tithe anymore? Does that mean that I don't have to give anymore? No, it doesn't mean that. The Holy Spirit is generous. Hallelujah. By the grace of God, you will never be stingy. Look at the word of God. Psalm 51 verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is generous. You know what? When God touches your heart, He'll touch your pocket as well. He'll touch your purse. Hallelujah. Amen. The Holy Spirit is generous. We think, you know, now we're under grace that, you know, we don't have to give anymore or we only give when we feel like it. No, actually, because you're under grace, you'll give more. Hallelujah. You'll give more than, than, than what you would give under the law. Praise God. And, and next week, I'm going to share more about the tithe. But the, the first thing is that what we do with our money is not based by the law, but by grace through faith. Number two, we do not go, gain God's favor by giving. He first expects us to give ourselves and then our gifts. And that's a huge key. God wants us to give of ourselves before we give of our gifts. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, that the, two, the two chapters speaking just about finances, chapter 8 verse 5, And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. And so really it's, it's the Macedonians who were an example. They were very generous givers in the church. And so they, the Bible says they, they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. And this is a huge key that we need to make sure that we've given our hearts to God. We've given our lives to God. And giving of ourselves, that is actually the starting point. In Romans chapter 12, Verses 1 and 2, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So you've got to give yourselves first, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So yeah, we see that you've got to give yourself to God first and then you will know what God's will is for your life, for your finances. Hallelujah. So there's an order. It's give yourself first and then your gift. Give yourself your life first and then God will reveal His will. And there's three things about the will of God. The will of God is good. Hallelujah. The will of God is acceptable and the will of God is perfect. Praise the Lord. Number three is God's grace provides abundance and this is a, a key to to give correctly in 2 corinthians chapter 9 verse 8 it says and god is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work. That is such a powerful scripture because it, it, when you look at that, it kind of like it, it covers everything of our lives. All grace, all sufficiency, all things, all times you may abound in every good work. And so that talks about abundance. When I read that verse, it says that God, when, God, when God's grace abounds, when God starts giving to me, I have overflow hallelujah and why do i have overflow well so that i can give to other people god's grace provides abundance acts 20 verse 35 says in all things i have shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak and remember the words of the lord jesus how he said himself it is more blessed to give than to receive it's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, how can I give if I don't have? Well, when grace abounds, you will have more than enough. Hallelujah. We receive greater blessing by giving than by receiving. It's, an, it's another level. It's a higher level. It's great to receive. It's nice to be re on the receiving end. Hallelujah. You know that. I know that. But it's even a greater blessing. It's a higher level when you can give to other people. 
And then the fourth one, a fourth key to giving the correct way is to understand that giving is sowing. Giving is sowing. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So a few things we can take from that scripture is, first of all, it's he's comparing giving financially as sowing, sowing seed, like a farmer. A farmer goes out and a farmer sows seeds. And what happens when the farmer sows seeds? Well, there's a crop. There's a harvest that comes forth. And so the Bible says that your, your giving is, is actually like sowing. And he says that those who sow sparingly will reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So in other words, we reap in proportion to what we sow, just like the farmer. And so your giving has so much to do with your total prosperity. Praise God. Proverbs 11 verse 25 says that the generous shall prosper. Hallelujah. You know, when I think about a farmer, a farmer doesn't just throw, throw, throw his seed in any place. No, he tills the land. He chooses the land. He prepares the soil and he strategically plants his seed and then he waters the seed and he takes care of the seed and then he has an expectation of the seed to grow and to bring fruit eventually hallelujah and so a farmer is very strategic and he chooses his soil it's the same with with us and our and our seed our, our financial seeds that we sow don't just throw it anywhere you've got to strategically place the seed where you get fed, place it into fertile soil where the gospel is preached, where, where, where people, where that ministry wins souls, hallelujah, where they take care of the ministers, of the orphans and the widows, praise God, because that is fertile soil. You know, places like our ministry in Pastor Deal's ministry, King's Revival Church, we spread the gospel. You know, it's fertile soil. And so don't just scatter the, 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 your finances. Any op- You've got to pray about it. You've got to strategically place the seed that God has given you. And then don't get discouraged when, when you, while you're waiting for your harvest. Because there is an interval between the sowing and the reaping. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up we will reap in due season you will reap hallelujah all the tithes that you have that you have brought to the church every seed that you have sown every offering that you have given god sees sees it and god will bring that seed into fruition hallelujah the fifth key is giving is part of our worship exodus 23 verse 15 you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread As I commanded you, you shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty handed. And so we see here this was the Passover. And this was a specific command to the people of Israel. And and God says, don't appear before me empty handed. Don't come without, without an offering. In Psalm 96 verse 8, it says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. It speaks about worship. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Bring an offering. First bring an offering and then come into His courts. Hallelujah. Giving to God is sacred. We should do it prayerfully. We should do it worshipfully. And we should do it in faith. And you know what? God doesn't need our tips. When we go to church, when we bring our offering, when we bring our tithe, it's not, you know, shake shake the the jacket and, and see if we can just pull out a few dirhams, a few coins. No, God says it's a form of your worship. It's a part of your worship when you bring your 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 offering, your giving. Hallelujah. So five principles concerning the correct way to give. Number one. What we do with our money is not based by the law, but by grace through faith. Number two, God first expects us to give of ourselves and then our gifts. Number three, grace 
provides abundance. The grace will abound in all things at all times so that you have more than enough to be a blessing to others. Number, number four, giving is sowing. Giving is sowing. It's like sowing a seed. When you sow those seeds, when you start giving, you can expect a harvest. And number five, giving is part of worship. It's a sacred part of worship. It needs to be prayerful. It needs to be, it needs to be thoughtful. It needs to be prayerful. It's part of your worship. And it's something that we don't just do haphazardly. Hallelujah. It's, it's part of our worship. Praise God. Well, I, I pray that this has given you more clarity on what the Bible says about finances. And next week, I'm looking forward because I'm going to talk about the tithe. Hallelujah. We're going to look at the Bible and what the Bible teaches about our tithes. Hallelujah. I pray that you've been blessed today. And I want us to close with a, with a short prayer before we go. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive us for where we have not been accurate within our finances. Forgive us, Lord, where we have missed it. Forgive us for where we have not been accurate. We repent today and we commit to giving the right way. We commit to giving the way that you have described in the Bible. Father, I thank you that you provide every financial need that there might be today, that you will provide, that you will make a way, and that you will, will provide for every financial need in every home represented today. Thank you that my God shall supply all my needs according to Christ's riches in glory. Thank you, Lord, for provision in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for healing right now over every person that is struggling with, with, with an illness or a disease. By the stripes of Jesus, be healed in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for restoration and unity in every home, every managed marriage today. Thank you for peace and restoration and reconciliation in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, I speak your blessing and your blood to cover everyone listening today. And we thank you, Lord, for a great week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. There we go, church. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. And we will see you this week at our services, our main services. Don't miss Pastor Dill. He's preaching up a storm. And I know that you're going to be blessed by the message. God bless you. We see you this weekend. Bye-bye.